Welcome to the story of young Warren Buffett, which will go through his early investing years. Our first part discussed Buffett's early investments and how he worked for his idol Ben Graham. This part will go through his iconic partnership years, where he returned 31% compounded per year. And we will explain his most important investments leading to this return. If you like this type of video, please leave a like and subscribe to help us trigger the YouTube algorithm. This channel focuses on market documentary and educational videos. We also have a second channel called TMIO Tesla. Our last video ended with Buffett scorning the use of too much leverage. Sure, if we'd leveraged up Berkshire, we'd have made a whole lot more money, obviously, over the years. Leverage is one of those things that works 99 yeah. times out of 100, and when it doesn't, you know, it's all over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, Buffett Partnership Limited, or BPL, seemingly broke this rule. Let's explain. In May 1956, he raised 105000 but that 105000 was structured like debt to Buffett himself, and he contributed only a mere $100 of his own money, and he kept his $60,000 cash hoard outside the partnership. Buffett, like many hedge fund managers, took a performance fee where he would take 25% of all profits above a 4% threshold. However, he had an interesting quirk where he guaranteed partners 4% a year in interest payments even if he lost money. So, if the fund lost 50%, while Buffett would not need to compensate the losses, he would still need to make the 4% interest payments. This levered structure got increasingly risky as people added more money. In 1961, Buffett was worth 230000 but the partnership had over $2.2 million, meaning if the fund returned 0%, then Buffett would still owe approximately $88,000 in interest payments. Because of this, Buffett changed the rules, and he said in his 1961 letter, in the event of losses, there will no longer be a carryback against amounts previously credited to me as general partner. Also, Buffett either smartly or fortunately almost never lost money, and had impressive investment performance in 1957 and 1958. The partnership's strategy was different from Buffett's today, which we described in our first video. His early strategy mixed Graham with Buffett, though, unlike Graham, Buffett did not like to diversify. However, he did follow Graham's advice of having a portion of his assets in arbitrage situations. Buffett stated that he liked to have 15 to 30 percent of his money in these situations, which he called workouts. He called it a workout because an outcome had already been announced and the investor simply needed to wait for the event to happen. The risk to arbitrage is if the transaction fails for whatever reason. A benefit of workouts are that they are often uncorrelated to the rest of the stock market, meaning if we have a weird event where the market drops 30%, which we saw in early 2020, then an arbitrage opportunity often does not drop that much. Here's an example in 2020 of Tiffany stock, which is expected to be bought out for $135 in the second half of 2020. This is why Ray Dalio, a legendary hedge fund manager, calls uncorrelated assets the holy grail of investing. Buffett recognized this advantage and say his arbitrage investment didn't drop so much in a market crash. Then he could shift money around into an investment that had dropped a lot. Despite Buffett having tremendous success in workouts, he did begin to move away from Graham's strategies and a notable event in 1959 accelerated this switch. At this time, he met Charlie Munger, who is now typically known as Buffett's right-hand man. Munger is also a notable critic of Graham's methods, and Buffett credits Munger with this change in philosophy. Charlie Munger added what to you? Oh, Charlie Munger changed my views. He refined them in a huge way in terms of looking for the quality companies and, and, and however when they first met munger was 35 and currently working as a lawyer and had little investment experience munger was very impressed in the 29 year old buffett who told him about his partnership's impressive investment returns and the two quickly became friends charlie and so you have to calibrate with charlie though because charlie says everything i do is dumb but <laughs> <laughs> but if he says it's really dumb then i know it is but if he just says it's dumb i take that as a affirmative vote <laughs> Buffett may have also told Munger about his first large investment inside the partnership that we will explore, Sanborn Maps. Buffett's partnership had around $3 million in assets when he put 35% of their assets in this investment. Sanborn Map was once a big business whose maps helped insurance companies. However, new actuarial techniques in the 1950s diminished the importance of maps to calculate risk and revenue was in decline. Buffett noticed that while the company showed it had 2.6 million of investments, the market value of these investments was closer to 7.6 million. 
At the time, accounting rules said investments were valued at cost. Therefore, Sanborn Map had $72 a share in investments alone, yet the stock traded around $45. BPL accumulated 24,000 shares, or 23% of the company. Buffett called Sandboard Map a cigar butt investment. It's true. I mean, we went into a terrible business because it was cheap. And it's what I refer to as the used cigar butt approach to investing. You know, that you see the cigar butt down there, it's soggy, you know, it's terrible. But there is one puff in it, and it's free. And, and, <laughs> But behind the euphemistic name is actually a corporate raider, as there is no such thing as a free puff. Buffett would use his stake to get himself elected to the board of directors. He then proposed two companies, one which would allow shareholders to receive $6.5 million of the company's investment portfolio. The second company would be left with $1.1 million of securities and the map business. The proposal was eventually accepted begrudgingly by management, and 72% of shareholders turned in approximately 75,600 shares for 6.5 million of investments, or roughly $86 a share. This investment helped his partnership gain close to $41 a share, or $1 million in 1960. He also returned 23% compared to a 6% loss from the Dow Jones. The Dow Jones is an index representing the value of what is supposed to be America's 30 most influential companies. With all this profit, Buffett needed to find his next cigar butt. He found Dempster Mill, and in 1961, in typical Buffett fashion, he invested heavily. Dempster made windmills and irrigation systems in Beatrice, Nebraska, and had $9 million of sales but was essentially a break-even business. Buffett used his cash war chest from the successful Sanborn investment to buy 1.2 million in Dempster, or approximately 70% of the company, and he took control in August 1961. He then modified Graham's net current asset value technique to calculate Dempster's liquidation value. For example, in his 1962 letter, he showed that Dempster had 6.9 million of assets, but only 2.3 million of liabilities. He then assigned liquidation value to various assets. For example, he assumed inventory could be liquidated at 60% of its original value, and he assumed the plant and equipment could be liquidated at auction value. With this conservative assessment, he valued Dempster in a worst case scenario at $35 a share, $7 above the price he paid. Despite paying a great price, the investment quickly went south and Dempster almost went bankrupt in early 1962 as it had only 166,000 of cash. The banks threatened to close it down and Buffett risked losing 1.2 million or 15% of his investment fund. Buffett rarely enjoys asking for help, but when he does ask for help, he typically asks for only Charlie Munger. If you need advice and feedback about an idea or decision, I'd like to know who do you go to? Well, usually I look in the mirror, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I've got a terrific partner, a fellow named Charlie Munger, and you, you can't find anybody any smarter, any, any better quality of anything, but we think a lot alike. Though, in his letter, Charlie is simply referred to as the anonymous good friend. Munger recommended that Buffett hire Harry Bottle, a cost-cutting manager. Buffett later said, hiring Harry may have been the most important management decision I have ever made. Dempster was in big trouble. Bottle slashed payroll, reduced inventory, and allowed Dempster to survive. Buffett then hailed Bottle as his man of the year in his 1963 letter. He was enjoying his cigar butt so much that he even went for a second puff. He put an advertisement in the Wall Street Journal saying he was selling Dempster. But the townspeople of Beatrice, Nebraska protested because they felt the next owner could liquidate even more of the company than Buffett did. The townspeople eventually paid Buffett $3.3 million to return the company back to them. Buffett partnership earned approximately $50 a share on this investment, or $2 million of profit, helping his fund gain 39% in 1963. By the end of 1963, Buffett was worth $2.4 million, but Buffett didn't like how the townspeople of Beatrice now viewed him as a bad guy, and he started to alter his cigar butt strategy for his next investment. American Express, known as Amex, was not a cigar butt. It was a high-flying stock which traded at $65 a share in 1963, despite earning only $2.50 a share. This implies a price-to-earnings of close to 30 times. 
It had 4.4 million of shares outstanding, so the market value of the equity was 289 million. Amex was hit by a fairly large scandal in November 1963. It was seemingly defrauded out of $150 million. The scam was labeled by the New York Times as the strangest market scandal of the century. The scandal also inspired a book. When the scam was revealed, Amex had only 79 million of shareholders' equity, so it appeared it was going bankrupt. What happened? American Express stored commodities for people such as cocoa beans or oil because people preferred to store their commodities at a warehouse rather than carrying around these heavy commodities. In return, they received a warehouse receipt. This receipt had a value and could be traded to another investor or a bank who could loan you money against this receipt. A fraudulent trader had a plan. He deceived American Express by bringing oil barrels to its facility, but these containers were filled with water and only a little bit of oil. Therefore, he got a full warehouse receipt when only some of the tank contained valuable oil. When the scam was revealed, Amex stock plunged from $65 to about $37, and people worried that Amex was going bankrupt. But there was a bit of a loophole. American Express's warehousing facility was a separate corporate entity, and the separate entity just declared bankruptcy. The parent, American Express, then was not technically legally obligated to refund the losses to banks and investors. And Amex was able to say confidently in its 1964 annual report that it didn't expect to pay more than $45 million. Buffett studied the situation in a non-Gram-like way. He visited Omaha coffee shops to see if people still use their Amex cards, and he noticed they did. This meant that Amex kept its strong reputation among customers. However, he didn't purchase the stock until he found out that the warehousing company could be separated off by declaring bankruptcy. In fact, Amex was not technically obligated to even pay a dollar, so some of its shareholders protested when American Express said it would pay back $45 million. Buffett felt while the company was not legally obligated to pay any money, it was morally obligated to pay back some money. He said, the American Express that paid something was worth substantially more than the American Express disclaiming responsibility. What is a little bit humorous about Buffett's comment is technically they're morally obligated to pay back the full 150 million, but he recommended only 60 million. Having said that, Amex did restore some credibility by making this payment. In 1964 and 1965, Amex stock remained depressed and Buffett kept buying. He even changed the rules of his partnership to buy more. His new rule said he could put up to 40% of the partnership's money in one asset. Eventually, the partnership owned 5% of the company. On average, he paid $58 a share, or $13 million in total. In 1968, he sold the investment for $180 a share, a staggering profit of $27 million, helping his partnership end 1968 with $100 million of assets. This was a very successful investment and may show that Buffett was moving away from cigar butt investing. However, he then purchased his biggest cigar butt of them all, Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway was a textile mill located in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and this company has defined his legacy. Despite Berkshire having a value of over $400 billion in early 2020, Buffett often says this investment was one of his biggest mistakes. Well, I made, I've made a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistake, in, uh, well, not the biggest, necessarily the biggest, but, but buying Berkshire Hathaway itself was a mistake because Berkshire was a lousy textile business. And I bought it very cheap. I'd been taught by Ben Graham to buy things on a quantitative basis. Look around for things that are cheap. In the 1950s, Berkshire Hathaway sales were decreasing rapidly. In 1955, it had 112 million of sales, but by 1961, sales had dwindled to 62 million. Buffett began buying a small amount of stock at 750 a share, when the book value was around 1946. So this was definitely a Graham-like investment. Buffett was even more excited because Berkshire's management was often repurchasing shares through tender offers. A tender offer is simply a formalized offer where a company says it will buy back a set number of shares at a set price. Shareholders can then choose to sell their shares back to the company for this price. In 1962, Buffett bought a small position of 80,000 shares at $8 for 640,000 in total. For context, his partnership had 26.1 million of assets at the end of 1964. So this was a relatively small investment for his firm. 
Buffett wanted Berkshire to rebuy his shares, so he visited its offices in May 1964, asking management if they were planning another tender offer. The CEO told Buffett yes, and he said there would be an offer to rebuy shares at 1150. According to Buffett, they even shook hands on this price. However, when Buffett returned to Omaha, the offer he got in the mail was to rebuy his shares at $11.37. And he felt cheated out of 12.5 cents per share. So rather than sell his 80,000 shares at a small profit, his blood boiled, and in a fit of rage, he accumulated another 310,000 shares, bringing his total to 393,000. And his partnership now owned 39% of the company. By April 1965, Buffett was able to force out prior management and take control. Buffett was quite pleased with himself and wrote in early 1966 that Berkshire was a delight to own, though it was a delight that eventually cost $5.5 million or about 20% of his partner's money. In 1966 and 1967, he bought even more shares, eventually capping his ownership at 691,000 shares or 70% of the company. However, this investment quickly went south. Buffett admitted in his 1967 letter that Berkshire's results were a considerable drag on performance. But the negative experience from Dempster meant he was too afraid to liquidate the company. Berkshire's textile mills made extremely poor results from 1970 to 1985, earning only $6 million before tax over a 16-year period. Buffett officially shut down the mills in 1985. Buffett did a couple things right. He was able to use the slim profit from Berkshire in the mid-1960s to make some investments. And Berkshire's cash hoard reached $6 million at the end of 1966, which was a substantial increase from the company's cash position before BPL obtained control. Buffett then issued $2 million of debt to help fund the purchase of National Indemnity in 1967 for approximately $8.6 million. And the rest, they say, is history. In 2019, Buffett described National Indemnity as the largest property and casualty insurer in terms of equity size. And he says it has been the engine propelling Berkshire's growth since 1967. Buffett's net worth was approximately $30 million when he ended his partnership in 1969. By 1985, he was worth over a billion, and today he is worth over $70 billion. However, Buffett has generously given a lot of his money to charity. Had he been Scrooge McDuck and kept it all and never gave to charity, he would own 462000 of Berkshire shares today, worth over $157 billion. There is a lot more of the Buffett story to tell. For example, when Buffett ended his partnership, his wealth was spread between three companies, Blue Chip Stamps, Diversified Retailing Company, and Berkshire Hathaway. The value was split accordingly. These three companies also helped solidify Buffett's relationship with Munger. Let us know in the comments if there is enough demand for a midlife Buffett video. Also, let's finish the video with our favorite Buffett quote. Someone once said the chains of habit are too are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. And I see that all the time. I see people with habit patterns that are self-destructive.